Before watching this lecture, it will be useful if you have reviewed the kinematics and muscle recruitment patterns associated with, associated with walking. Our goals today are to learn about gait kinetics and to understand what makes gait efficient. In the first part of today's lecture, we'll be looking at gait kinetics. Before we do that, we should summarize some of the general characteristics of muscle activation patterns associated with walking. When we look at the swing limb, muscle activity is mostly seen at the beginning and the end of the swing phase. This is related to the fact that in mid-swing, it's possible for the pendular dynamics of the limb to be used to move the limb. When we look at the stance limb, muscle activity is seen throughout the stance phase. The function of this muscle activity is to support both postural control and progression. Subfunctions sub related to postural control include supporting the body against gravity and stabilizing the stance limb against the impact of foot strike. The function of progression is to generate the forces needed to move the body through the environment. So, what are the basic differences between how the posture of the body is controlled in the task of standing versus how the posture of the body is controlled during the task of walking? In the case of steady state standing balance, the center of mass always stays within the base of support, or more, or more precisely, it stays within the limits of stability. In the case of steady state walking, the center of mass is routinely outside the base of support. In the case of standing balance that's performed in the context of a level and stable ground surface, it's ankle torques that are typically going to be used to control the posture of the whole body. In contrast, in the case of steady state gait, it's hip torques that are frequently going to be recruited to control the posture of the head, arms, and the trunk. Compared to joint kinematics, there is significant variability in joint kinetics. For example, here we see the hip joint angle and hip joint torque plotted as a function of gait cycle time. In both of these plots, the central thick line in each plot represents the average joint angle or joint moment, and the dotted lines that surround the thick line represent the amount of variability that there was in the values that went into the mean. In the case of hip, the hip joint angle, we see that the two dotted lines are close to the solid line throughout the gait cycle. This tells us that across the gait cycle, there is a consistent pattern of hip joint motion, and there's not much variability around it. In the case of hip joint, mo in the case of hip joint moment or hip torque, we see that the two dotted lines are much further away from the average during stance, and that they are close to the average during swing. This shows us that there's cycle-to-cycle -cycle variation in the torques produced, produced at the hip during the stance phase. We will explore why this is the case in the next couple of, a couple of slides. Before we do this, I want to review the basic procedure for calculating variability, so that you can understand how these types of graphs are created when you see them. In this plot, we see four lines. Each line represents one heel strike to heel strike recording of joint torque. Because the time between heel strikes will change stride to stride, we time normalize the recordings as we discussed last semester. By doing this, we'll end up with joint torque plotted as a function of gait cycle time. We can clearly see that each of the four lines is different. This shows us that the joint torques are changing stride to stride. To assess the variability in the data, we look at each moment in the gait cycle and calculate the standard deviations of values that are observed in that moment. The more spread apart the values are on the different strides, the larger the standard deviation will be. This method gives us a standard deviation at each moment throughout the gait cycle. We can summarize the variability we are observing with the coefficient of variation. We see that the hip joint angle has a coefficient of variation of 19%, whereas hip joint torque has a coefficient of variation of 72%. The coefficient of variation is calculated by taking the mean of the standard deviation values that have been calculated at each moment in the gait cycle. This value is then squared, square rooted, 
and then divided by the mean absolute value for the whole, for the whole trial. A trial here is made up of however many gate cycles have been recorded. So let's start looking at gate kinetics. We'll be focusing most of our discussion on sagittal plane gate kinetics. On this slide, we'll be looking at stance phase kinetics. Here we see the joint torques for the hip, the knee, and the ankle. To understand the function of these torques, we can look at how these torques combine to create a net support moment. The net support moment is simply the sum of the extension torques. That is, those joint torques that are acting to extend the, law, extend, extend the limb and to hold up the body, to hold the body erect. We see that a large net support moment is created throughout the stance phase. I've placed some purple lines on the figure on the left. These purple lines identify a particular moment in early stance. At this particular moment, we see that there are extension torques at the hip, the knee, and the ankle. We can visualize these torques on a diagram of the body. We can see that there is a torque acting to extend the hip, that there's a torque acting to extend the knee, and a torque acting to extend or plantar flex the ankle. These each create anti-gravity leg extension torques that combine to create the net extensor moment. Now let's look at what's going on in terminal stance. So I've identified this particular moment in the stance phase with the green lines in the figure. In our diagram of the human body, we can see that we have a relatively small flexion torque at the, uh, at the hip and the knee, and a large extension torque at the ankle. These combine to create a new support moment. The ankle is responsible for creating the net support moment in this part of the gait cycle. Therefore, the function of producing anti-gravity leg extension is carried out predominantly by this joint. Well, entirely by this joint. The ankle also performs the function of generating a propulsive force that pushes the body forwards from behind. The torques at the hip and the knee act to start accelerating the limb up and forwards. Joint torques exhibit significant variability. As we mentioned earlier, the reason for this is related to the principle of adaptive covariation that we encountered when discussing synergies. Adaptive covariation is clearly evident in stance phase joint torque patterns where we see that various distinctive strategies can be employed to create the anti-gravity limb extension torque that is used to hold up the body. So here we see one strategy. Here the hip creates a flexor torque. This torque can be used to stabilize the posture of the head, arms and trunk. The knee and the ankle create extension torques that can combine to create the net extensor moment needed to maintain the anti-gravity function of the limb. Now here we see a different strategy. Note that we have the ex that we're looking at the exact same moment in the gait cycle, but this time we have a completely different pattern of, of joint torques being utilized. Here the hip is creating the net extensor moment needed to maintain the anti-gravity function of the limb. The knee now is providing a flexion torque that provi provides a propulsion function that pulls the body forwards from in front. So what are we seeing here? Here we're seeing two dramatically different strategies that both effectively perform the anti-gravity function of the limb. The implication here is that there's not just one way of realizing the functions that support walking. There's redundancy in the support moment strategy. This redundancy or adaptive covariation allows various functions to be expressed as needed. It's conceivable that you could watch a patient walking across the clinic and that the strategy that they are employing could change from one moment to the next. In reality, different strategies are likely to, promoted by, to, to be promoted by subtle changes in the context of constraints, such as changes in the posture of the head, arms, trunk, 
changes in surface inclination, fatigue, and so on. What we described on the last slide is the ability of a person to have redundant means of supporting the basic essential functions of locomotion. Flexible covariation across hip, knee, and ankle supports a reliable yet flexible body support function. It also supports the freedom to adaptively control the posture of the body and the manner in which the body is propelled through the environment. In our lectures on posture, we identify degeneracy as an important quality identified in modern theories of synergies. Degeneracy of muscle function refers to the fact that the same muscle can be organized to support various different functions at different times. On the previous slides, we saw that the hip muscles can be organized to support very different functions. They can support the control of trunk posture in one moment, and in another moment they can play a vital role in supporting the, the body and in providing the anti-gravity function for, for, for locomotion. The implication here is that there are minimally two separate synergies that are involved in performing the anti-gravity function of the limb, and that these synergies can overlap in the muscles that they recruit. The fact that two synergies can recruit the same muscles means that compensations are needed from other muscles within the synergy. Before we continue looking at other aspects of the kinetics of walking, let's momentarily explore the notion of flexibility and redundancy in the organization of movement. The word redundancy refers to there being redundant ways of an action being performs, but performed. Redundancy means that a task can be performed in more than one way. A clear example of motor flexibility and redundancy is revealed in a study by Bernard. Bernard asked participants to sustain a two-legged hopping task for as long as they were able. The task always required that you jump to the same height. Specifically, you were asked to jump to 30% of your max ho maximum ho hopping height and to jump two times a second. The subjects in this research were able to, to, to keep performing the task for between 23 and 44 minutes. Subjects were able to maintain their hopping height throughout the experiment. Fatigue in this task mostly affects ankle extensors. Here we see the ground reaction forces generated in this task shown as a function of the hopping cycle. Within the contact phase, that is, when the feet are in contact with the ground, we have an eccentric subphase where the, the, the fall of the body onto the ground is controlled and much of the energy of the fall is stored. And we have a concentric subphase in which the body is propelled upwards, aided by active muscle contraction and the release of the stored elastic energy. In this graph, we can see a thick black line as well as a thin gray line. The thin gray line shows the average pattern of ground reaction force that was generated at the start of the experiment, that is, before the, the participant was fatigued. The thick black line shows the average pattern of ground reaction force that was generated towards the end of the experiment, when the participant was fatigued. You can notice that even though the two subjects are still managing to jump to the same height, that, they're in ch that, that there's changes in how forces build up, built, built up in the contact phase. In general, when the subjects became fatigued, they landed with more flexed knees and with increased in activity of the rectus femoris. What we are observing in the strategy then is that the knees are being used to compensate for fatigue at the ankle. The knees are being used to generate, store, and absorb more energy to a greater degree as you become more fatigued. Although a knee-based compens compensation was the typical compensation, co compensation strategy, large individual differences were seen in the specifics of the compensation strategies used. One strategy was to change the degree to which a particular muscle was relied upon. Here we see that this particular subject, subject A, is more heavily relying on the vastus lateralis as they get fatigued in order to create greater knee extension torque. 
Another strategy that was involved involved changing the timing of muscle activations. Here, when we look at the recruitment of the gastrocnemius in a different participant, subject B, we see much earlier pre-activation of this muscle. This potentially means that the participant is attempting to store a greater amount of strain energy in the muscle, and therefore decrease the amount of active contraction that would be, would be needed in the concentric phase of the task. Before we took that little detour to look at hopping, we were looking at stance phase gait kinetics. Now let's look at joint torques in the swing phase. Here we again see the joint torques for the hip, the knee and the ankle, and the resulting net support moment. Let's start by looking at early swing phase joint torques. In the early swing phase, what we see is that the hip torques are performing the function of pulling the limb forwards. This helps set the limb in motion so it can swing forwards and later act to catch the body as the body is falling forwards. We also see a small knee extension torque. The hip flexion pulls the whole limb forward. If unchecked, this will cause the knee to flex. The small knee extension torque counteracts this tendency and will slow and control the passive knee flexion generated by the interaction torque. The knee extension torque allows for control of how the limb moves through, the, through space, how the limb progresses forwards. Here we see the joint torques in terminal swing. In this phase of the, the gait cycle, we see an extensor torque at the hip and a flexor torque at the knee, acting to decelerate the limb. This deceleration acts to control the progression of the, of the foot to allow for a controlled heel strike. At self-selected, comfortable walking speeds, joint torques will heavily depend upon the pendulum dynamics of the limbs. The active torques that are generated through the actions of the muscles will work in concert with the torques that are generated due to the physics of the limbs. On the, left, on the left image, we see the torques that are generated through the action of the muscles. These are the neuromuscular torques that are organized by the central nervous system. On the right, we have the torques generated from the pendulum physics of the limbs. In this image, we're just looking at the torques associated with potential energy. In early swing, we see the pull of gravity on the limbs generating a torque that acts to pull the limb forwards. In terminal stance, we see gravity is acting to pull the limb backwards, and, this co and thus contributes to the function of decelerating the limb. Later in this lecture, we'll talk about what makes for efficient movement. One of the most important principles when it comes to movement efficiency is the ability to work with the forces you get for free with, uh, in the context of the action that you're performing. As with steady state balance, the concept of center of mass is valuable for helping us to understand steady state gait. The movements of the center of mass during walking depend upon the speed of walking. Here in, this, in these graphs, we can see how displacements of the center of mass in the medial lateral and inferior, in inferior superior directions vary with walking speed. On the y-axis, we have walking speeds ranging from very slow walking up to a self-selected comfortable pace. In the case of mediolateral displacements, we see that the amount of movement of the center of mass is much larger when you're walking slowly. In contrast, when you're looking at vertical displacements, that is, how much the center of mass is moving up and down while you walk, we see that these movements are larger at the fastest walking speeds that are closest to our preferred walking speed. The increase in mediolateral center of mass displacements at slow speeds means that balance is, le is, is, uh, that balance is less stable at these speeds. Here we see the changes in step length and step width as a function of walking speed. The smallest circles show the location of heel strikes for the slowest speed of walking that was analyzed in this research. The largest circles show the heel strike locations for the fastest speeds of walking analyzed. What uh, we can see here that when walking speed is slowest and the media lateral stability is lowest, that the beta base of support is at its widest. We also see a decrease in step length at the slower speeds. 
In some, at slower speeds, we're seeing larger step widths and smaller step lengths. We've now mentioned the notion of preferred walking speed a number of times. The preferred walking speed is the speed of walking that feels comfortable to you and, would be, uh, and, and that you would be most likely to adopt on a long walk. Here we see some data collected by Holt and colleagues. In this study, Holt had participants walk on a treadmill at various speeds. He measured the medialateral motion of, the, uh, of participants' heads while they were walking. He also measured the amount of oxygen that was consumed while walking. On the y-axis of this graph, we see the percentage of the self-selected stepping frequency. 100% on this axis represents a person walking at a speed that they report to be most comfortable for them. 75% on, on, on this axis then represents a person walking at three quarters of their comfort speed or preferred speed. So on this graph, we can see what happens when a person is walking faster or slower than their preferred walking speed. We have two y-axis measures on this graph. The line with the green squares shows the standard deviation of medialateral head motion. High values of this variable mean that the head is swaying more and the body is less balanced. The line with the red circles is the amount of oxygen consumption. The greater oxygen consumption means that there is greater metabolic cost of walking in, this particular, in that particular condition. In this graph then, we see that head motion, motion is least variable and oxygen consumption is at its lowest at walking frequencies that are closest to the comfort or preferred walking speed. In general, the implications here are that for any particular gait speed, an individual is going to select a stride length and stride frequency that results in the lowest metabolic cost and the greatest postural stability. When driven away from these preferred, preferred states, oxygen costs are going to rise and head stability is going to decrease. The optimization principle that's connected to oxygen consumption is easy to understand. When oxygen consumption is lower, you're going to expend less energy to do the task at hand, and therefore you can do more. In the case of head stability, there are two, op op there are two optimizations that are potentially implicated. The first is related to postural stability. When my head is, is swaying more, my center of mass is likely also swaying more, and therefore my body is less stably balanced. The second optimization uh, pr pr uh, principle relates to vision. If my head is stabilized, my ability to visually detect information about the world around me and my actions relative to it is potentially improved. The simple conclusion to be drawn from this, uh, this graph is that we tend to state, select states of organization that are optimal in some way, where a, a, a key example of that is selecting states of organization that are energetically efficient. What we're looking at here is efficiency principles. In other words, what it is that makes gait more or less functional in some way. So what is it that makes gait more or less efficient? A long-standing standing hypothesis has been that optimal or efficient gait depends upon efficiency principles connected to the physics of locomotion. If this hypothesis, hypothesis is correct, then it follows that in order to understand efficient or functional gait, we need to have a good understanding of the physics of locomotion. Some of the earliest serious investigations into the connection between gait physics and the efficiency of walking was performed by Sanders and colleagues back in 1953. Sanders observed that it takes work to move the center of mass. This observation was motivated by Newton's first law of motion. As you'll recall, this first law states that every body, that every body continues in a state of rest or in a state of uniform motion in a straight line unless it's compelled by impressed force to change that state. This means, in the context of gait, that any deviations of the center of mass of the body away from a state of not moving or 
moving at a constant velocity is going to require energy to be expended. Based upon this logic, Saunders hypothesized that the movements of the body during walking should be organized so as to minimize the displacements of the center of mass. Based upon this theory, we would expect that the energetic cost of walking would be least when the movements of the center of mass were minimized. Based upon their theory, Saunders and colleagues identified six characteristics or determinants, as they called it, of normal gait that act to minimize center of mass displacement away from a straight line trajectory. If this theory is correct, it should mean that if you have gait organized in a way that's consistent with these determinants, that you should have a more efficient gait. The first determinant that's identified in this theory was pelvic rotation. Here we see what the motion of the pelvis, hips and legs looks like when we have no pelvic rotation at the top and a large amount of pelvic rotation at the bottom. What we are looking at is changes in the degree of pelvic rotation in the transverse plane. Here we see how changing the transverse plane rotation of the pelvis impacts the vertical displacements of the center of mass. The dashed line shows how the center of mass is moving up and down when pelvic rotation is permitted, and the solid line shows how the center of mass is moving up and down when pelvic rotation is not permitted. What we see here then is that pelvic rotation leads to a flattening of the arc of the center of mass. Based upon Sanders' theory, we should de decrease the energetic cost of walking by making this particular gait adaptation. Put in other words, the reaching forwards with the pelvis ends up smoothing out the arc of motion of the center of mass. The next determinant is frontal plane pelvic tilt, or pelvic obliquity. In the diagram, notice that, it, that it's the pelvis on the side of the swing limb that it's dropping and that in order to stop the end of the limb catching on the ground, that we see swing limb knee flexion. So when we vault on the stance limb, we end up lifting up the stance limb on that side. In order to level out the trajectory of the center of mass, what we do is we drop the pelvis on the other side, and that ends up uh, minimizing the degree to which the center of mass is raised. So here we see the center of mass trajectory, both with and without pelvic tilt being permitted. This shows that leg movements that permit a drop in, in the pelvis on the side of the swing limb can reduce the arc of the center of mass. The next characteristic or determinant of gait that can reduce the arc of the center of mass is knee flexion of the stance limb. Here we, can see, here we can see that when a slight knee flexion is introduced into the stance limb, that the arc of the center, the arc of motion of the center of mass is further flattened. The next two determinants are foot and knee mechanisms. The combined action of knee flexion extension and ankle plantar flexion dorsiflexion during the, during the stance phase can combine together to smooth out the arc of the center of mass. The last determinant is the lateral displacement of the pelvis. Here we see the large lateral displacements of the pelvis that result, uh, that result from if you were to walk with your feet spread apart. Lateral displacement of the pelvis is minimized with knee valgus and adduction of the hip. Here we see the consequences of these adjustments. The side-to-side -side motion of the center of mass is reduced. What we're seeing here is that the center of mass is kept more within the base of support, reducing the laterally destabilizing torques. The six determinants of gait model proposed by Sanders and colleagues is just one theory of how walking should be organized in order to make it more, more efficient. 
an alternative theory was proposed by Farley and Ferris. Farley and Ferris pr propose an inverted pendulum model of normal gait. In this alternative theory, the metabolic cost of walking is reduced by the smooth mechanical transfer between kinetic and gravitational energies. Here we see the exchanges of kinetic and potential energies as the center of mass moves up and down through the gait cycle. In mid-stance, the center of mass is maximally elevated. At this point, the center of mass has the greatest, greatest amount of gravitational potential, potential energy, as is shown with the blue line, since the mass of the body has been raised up. By pre-swing, the, the center of mass has dropped to its lowest point. Here, the gravitational potential energy is at a minimum. Now, if we look at the kinetic energy of the center of mass, shown with the orange line, we see that, the, we see that when potential energy is at its minimum, kinetic energy is at its maximum. Remember, kinetic energy is associated with the velocity of motion. So what we're seeing here is transfers between gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. The tra uh, this transfer is represented nicely by the image of a bike going up and down a hill. The bike starts at the top of the hill with maximum potential energy, and it rolls down the hill. And as it rolls down the hill, the potential energy that it had at the top of the hill is converted into kinetic energy. Consequently, the bike gains speed. This kinetic energy can then be used to carry the bike back up the hill. According to this inverted pendulum model of normal gait. And contrary to the six determinants model, the center of mass must fluctuate in a sinusoidal fashion to achieve efficient transfer of mechanical energy. So here we see the raising and lowering of the center of mass during walking. Potential energy is maximal when the center of mass is at its peak. Kinetic energy is maximal after the center of mass has fallen forwards and the potential energy is at a minimum. This transfer of energy between kinetic and potential energy is facilitated by horizontal ground reaction forces. Horizontal ground reaction forces act to decelerate the body during the first half of the stance phase, as kinetic energy is uh, transferred into potential energy, and accelerate the body during the second half of stance phase as the potential energy is converted back into kinetic energy. Now that we've reviewed the six determinants model and the inverted pendulum model, let's look at some research that's attempted to compare and contrast their predictions. In the figure here, we see what an energetically optimal walking gait should look like based upon the predictions of the six determinants model and the inverted pendulum model. With the six determinants model, we see that the center of mass has a straight line and level trajectory. With the inverted pendulum model, we see the arc of the center of mass as the stance limb vaults on the, uh, vaults on the planted foot. When we think about the efforts that would be required to perform each of these movement patterns, we see that a much higher knee torque is going to be needed to support the body in the six determinants model. These anti-gravity knee extensor torques are required to maintain upright body posture. This simple analysis suggests that an inverted pendulum-based strategy for walking should be more efficient than the six determinants model, at least based upon this one component. So, how do we experimentally compare these two strategies? Gordon and colleagues had 10 participants walk on a treadmill with visual feedback about sacral position. The task in this experiment was to use the feedback you saw to minimize the vertical displacements that your center of mass was making. Using the visual feedback, participants were able to reduce their center of mass ver vertical displacement by 39%. This, re this resulted in a more than doubling of net metabolic cost increasing it by 113%. This research suggests that walking that is organized around the principles of the inverted pendulum model is more efficient than walking organized around the principles of the six determinants model. While this evidence is compelling, more recent studies seem to suggest that human, walkings, that human walking has characteristics of both models in its organization. The inverted pendulum model of walking 
motivates the dynamic walking model. The dynamic walking model captures the basic mechanics of bipedal legged locomotion. In this model, we have hip, knee, and ankle joints. We have a mass positioned above the hips, and we have a knee designed to lock in, an, in extension in order to create an inverted pendulum such that the mass of the body will vault over the stance limb. When this mechanism is put into motion, each foot strike generates a collision with the ground. This collision dissipates kinetic energy. The collision generates a force that is transferred up the leg and has a component that acts to decelerate the forward motion of the center of mass. Without some form of energy injection into the system that can counter this deceleration of, or to, uh, to, to forward motion, this mechanism will rapidly come to a stop. Here we see a strategy for injecting energy. And ankle dorsiflexion generates a, a push of force that restores the dissipated energy. This force is transferred up the leg to the center of mass. Here we see a close-up of the force vectors that are acting on the center of mass. We can see that the we can see, we can see the horizontal components that do work with respect to moving the body through the environment. The push-off force creates a, a, a positive form of propulsion, and, the, uh, and the, col the collision creates negative work for propulsion. The principles revealed in the dynamic walking model explain the effectiveness of pa passive walking robots. Here we see a robot that walks by having a motor that plantar flexes the ankle during pre-swing. This little injection of force keeps the robot walking. Insights into what makes for energetically efficient gait can be drawn from studying the efficiency of different designs of robots. Here we see two robots. The Asimo robot on the left is a highly complex and very versatile machine. All of its joints are motorized, and its movements through space can be precisely controlled via millions of lines of computer code. This, uh, this robot also has input from an array of sensors to help organize its movements. On the right, we have the Cornell bi biped that we briefly discussed on the previous slide. When we measure the energy that must be consumed to transport each kilogram of robot mass, uh, one meter through the environment, we see that Asimo is the least efficient. This is because Asimo is not design designed to work with the physics of the environment. I've provided links to videos showing these robots in the, uh, in the, uh, in the slides handout. If you look at the video of Asimo walking, you, um, you, you will see that the motion of Asimo's swing limb is precisely controlled, and it's not working with the pendular physics of the, of, of the limb. This control means that the limb is working against the pendulum physics of the limb, rather than with the pendulum physics of the limb. Another thing to notice on this slide is that the efficiency of human gait and of the Cornell biped are remarkably similar, suggesting that similar mechanisms must be at play. Energetic efficiency is just one aspect of what can make gait optimal or functional. Another as aspect of optimally organized gait is efficiently controlled gait. The Cornell biped has a very optimal control scheme. When the ankle is dorsiflexed by a, dorsiflexed by a certain amount during the stance phase, an ankle plantar flexion torque is created. Here then we have a minimally complex internal controller that's intervening minim minimally in the flow of the movement. In this robot, the functionality of locomotion comes from a design that allows for the efficient exploitation of the physics of the situation. Here we see the Asimo robot. This robot has a very complex and intelligent controller that intervenes hundreds of times a second. In this robot, there's a very high control cost. The functionality of locomotion in this robot comes from constant software control of every motor in the system. We can draw a parallel here to the control problem 
faced by Ian Waterman. Ian has to visually monitor nearly all aspects of his movements, and he does so at great cost to the efficiency of his movements. The advanced robots developed by Boston Dynamics are probably known to many of you, based upon the many internet videos that exist about them. Let's read a quote from Mark Raybert, the founder of Boston Dynamics. Many re researchers in neural motor control think of the nervous system as a source of commands that are issued to the body as direct orders. We believe that the mechanical system has a mind of its own, governed by the physical structure of the body and the laws of physics. Rather than issuing commands, the nervous system can only make suggestions which are reconciled with the physics of the system and the task. So what we're seeing here is some remarkable similarities to the kind of theory of human movement and human motor control that's being implied by the systems theory. In the last part of today's lecture, I want to discuss Holt's theory of dynamic resources. Mature preferred movement patterns are optimal in the sense that they minimize a particular set of cost, fun cost functions. Cost functions can include metabolic cost, the likelihood of injury to tissues, and the time taken to reach a particular goal. The question then is how does the system go about minimizing these costs? Holt and colleagues propo propose that coordinated actions become optimal through the effective use of dynamic resources. So what are dynamic resources? Dynamic resources are properties of the neuromuscular skeletal system that are available to the individual. These include both passive resources and active resources. Passive resources are mechanical mechanisms for force conservation, such as the pendulum dynamics of the legs during walking. Active resources, in contrast, are neural mechanisms for timing muscular force generation. An example of an active resource would be the push-off force generated from ankle plantar flexion that we see being used by the Cornell biped. This theory is consistent with the system's approach to motor control. It proposes that the functional movement pat patterns we, we observe are a consequence of the interplay of environmental and individual constraints, and a consequence of whether dynamic resources are being used effectively. We can use the concept of dynamic resources to help us understand why a particular gait pattern should be considered to be functional or dysfunctional. From a dynamic resources perspective, functional gait is, en is enabled by both passive and active resources. In the case of passive resources, the lower limbs can act as pendulums and springs that store, that store and exchange potential and kinetic energies. In the case of active resources, appropriately timed contraction of the gastrocnemius and soleus can provide a mechanism for injecting energy that is needed to create forward motion. The issue of, of appropriate timing is an important one. Dynamic re resources are useful to the individual only if they can be garnered at the right time with the right amount. Thus, if there is a neurological constraint that disrupts the normal timing of muscle contractions, no amount of strength will benefit the, the, the patient because muscle force cannot be produced at the right time. Conversely, normal timing of muscle contra contractions will be ineffectual if there is insufficient strength to meet the task demands. The theory of dynamic resources has motivated a particular perspective on clinical practice. Holt and colleagues propose that in physical therapy, we are evaluating and treating individuals with pathologies that essentially change their kinetics. A change in kinetics might mean a change in the ability to produce enough force at, a, uh, at the appropriate state of the system, or it might mean increased or decreased stiffness. From this perspective, PTs aim to assess and influence patient capability for injecting, storing, and returning energy. Let's look at a specific intervention that was motivated by the systems theory and the concept of dynamic resources.
individuals affected by spastic hemiplegic cerebral palsy have significantly impaired mobility. Activity limitations in this group include muscle weakness, spasticity, poor power production, coactivation of agonist-antagonist pairs, and morphological changes in muscle and connective tissue. These factors affect what dynamic resources are available to support functional activity. For example, poor power production affects the capacity for energy injection. Children affected by hemiplegic cerebral palsy attempt to compensate for their activity limitations by re relying more upon stiffness as a dynamic resource for energy storage and return in the affected limb. And it is the long-term use of this strategy that leads to the morphological changes in muscle and connective tissue that we see. Children with CP show greater stiffness in the more involved limb over the less involved limb as well as greater stiffness in both limbs compared to their, uh, their uh, non-disabled non peers. From the dynamic resources perspective, CP gait is the optimized functional gait given the constraints of the, in uh, given the, constraints of the individual in this group of individuals, and, as, uh, and is the optimized functional gait given the available passive and active resources that are available. Evidence that CP gait is optimal comes from observing, uh, observing some of the unfortunate side effects of the use of tendon lengthening surgeries within, within this cl clinical population. While this procedure does have some positive outcomes, including increases in range of motion and more normal looking walking patterns, the, forces, the, the force generation and energy storage ability of the tendons can be impaired by this procedure. This can lead to less energy efficiency and impaired mobility. Holt and colleagues considered an alternative to tendon lengthening surgeries that was motivated by the idea of trying to supply active dynamic resources. They, uh, they predicted that functional electrical stimulation, or FES, would decrease the need for the required adaptation of increased stiffness. FES enhances energy injection to the gastrocnemius and soleus muscle, uh, uh, muscle group during walking in children with hemiplegic spastic cerebral palsy. This intervention showed a small but significant decrease in the stiffness of the, sti the, 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 sti uh, the stimulated limb that persisted after treatment. In this lecture, we reviewed some of the main theories and concepts related to the question of what is optimal or functional mobility. Next lecture, we will be looking at reactive and proactive balance control for gait.